Hello, Susanna Lopez here. Actor turned barrister turned broadcaster turned true crime writer and proud member of Sisters in Crime Australia. Welcome to the Scarlet Stiletto Bites podcast. For over 30 years now, Sisters in Crime Australia has supported our women crime writers, both true crime and fiction, and some criminal literary talent has been unearthed. Among many awards, there's an annual prize for short crime fiction, the Scarlet Stiletto Awards. And for those of you who prefer your stories by ear, in 2023 we commenced this podcast series, Scarlet Stiletto Bites, to celebrate the sisters' 30th anniversary. Each story is short, but not always sweet. Expect twisted tales quirky humour, and a frisson of feminism. Please support us by following, sharing, reviewing, and generally spreading the word. We have no paywall. Today's story won the 2012 Scarlet Stiletto Malice Domestic Prize and deserves it. Fish for Freedom by Sarah Evans. Have you ever wondered what it'd be like to just walk away? You know, just put one foot in front of the other till you reach the end of the chocolate-coloured shag pile carpet, which he loves and you've always hated because you've had to vacuum it within an inch of its dreary life for all of yours. To tiptoe to the end of the paved path with its uneven slabs that trip you up when you're not concentrating as you hurry to catch the bus, twisting your ankle in two high heels that he insists you wear because he likes you acting the tart. To run to the end of the railway platform you commute from every boring weekday because he won't let you quit work to have a baby. To arrive at the end of the friggin' road to nowhere and realise there really is nothing else. What would it be like to move on and never look back? To shrug off life as you know it and travel on. No regrets, no goodbyes, no more dirty socks and jocks on the bedroom floor or wet towels pulled in sodden heaps in the bathroom, no more bins to empty, carpets to vacuum, Saturday nights to endure, no oppressive responsibility or respectability. (sighs) I've read about people who go missing after a, a, a train crash or a bombing and wondered what it was like just walking away from the carnage. Blink it so you don't get distracted. Shrugging off the the old skin like a snake. Sliding off through the jungle of emergency services and death to a new life full of fresh promise. What would you do? How would you do it? Would you keep spare cash in your bag just in case? A secret bank account in a false name where you'd squirrel away funds for that glorious rainy day? Would you steal an identity from an old gravestone so you could get a fake ID and passport? Would you stay in the country or fly away? Retrain or drop out? What? What? I don't know, but it appeals. Drudgery sucks the life force. I want more. To walk into a new life and and shed the old. You see, I crave marriage, kids, my own home. But I got a man who who's never said he loves me in the 20 years we've been together. No kids, no home. Just a dire rental with a dead lawn, a flea-infested shag pile and a big flat-screen TV. I don't know why I stay. I could just walk away into the vast blue yonder of expectation. Or swim, even. 
Hey, my partner has this fish. Actually, he's got several fish, but this particular one's huge and expensive and lives in a large fish tank with automatic feeders and filters and stuff right bang in the middle of our living room. He bought it off some dodgy bloke in the little China markets. Reckons it was a steal, as the fish didn't quite make the grade, being boss-eyed and a runt. Fish was a tiddler when Kenny first got it. Creamy white like one of the Milky Bar Kids snacks. Now it's so damn massive it, it can't swim because the tank's not wide enough for it to manoeuvre. So it's just stuck there, suspended like a Hearst installation in formaldehyde, letting the machines do the water thing across the gills. Kenny doesn't love fish just enjoys owning such a freak specimen. Sick man. I feel sorry for fish. So sorry that I stick magazine pictures with blue tack to the glass so it's got something nice to look at while I vacuum. Kenny thinks I'm barking. But fish need something to alleviate its day. So do I. Poor fish. Poor me. Tonight, the train crashed, and I wasn't prepared. No secret hoard of cash, no change of undies, no nothing, but a big scream as we made impact. Our carriage buckled, and I pitched into the lap of the bloke opposite. Stuff flew off the racks, landing on my head. The lights blacked out. People yelled and shrieked, and there was glass and steel and flames. I lay sprawled over this fat guy with his glasses askew, thinking, hey, this is my big chance. Offered on a platter. Get up and walk, lady. Walk into a new life. And then there was another explosion and a roar. Fire, someone yelled. And people I'd always considered bovine cud chewers stampeded fighting to get out, trampling anyone who got in their way, me and the fat guy included. The fat guy bounced me off his gut, and then I was part of the melee. And we were all clawing and pushing and pulling and mauling at each other until we got out of the mangled carriage. There was more commotion outside. The orange air was full of smoke and fuel and fear. And I walked. Just like that. Walk through the pitiful wailing and hysteria in my heels, laughing fit to burst a gasket, free. Fueled by adrenaline, I binned the heels and walked, walked, walked barefoot through unfamiliar city streets until kissed by a rosy dawn. By then, the urge to laugh had gone. I shivered. Cold, hungry and sore, I hunkered on a splintered park bench covered in a rich vocabulary of graffiti and mined my worldly possessions in the fluff-lined pockets of my jacket and shoulder bag. There wasn't much. One dirty handkerchief printed with tiny blue rosebuds, a safety pin... A button, a pitiful bit of cash, an elastic band, a pretty notebook, now dog-eared, which had been given me at a long-forgotten lucky Santa office party, a broken pencil, a big biro. Hmm. I wondered about Kenny. I worried about fish. Should I go home? Home? Who was I kidding? The place I left had never been a home. This was my chance at a new life. But what hope did I have with minimum dosh? None. So I walked back to an empty house, my feet now bleeding and called in sick. I'd fluffed my big opportunity. Kenny said, Where'd you get to last night? I had to get my own friggin' dinner. Big-hearted, that's my Ken. The train crashed. Oh, yeah, right it did. 
Dead right, you must have seen it on the news. No. Well, didn't you miss me? Yeah, I had to get my own tea, which is why I missed the news. Jeez, woman. I hope you fed fish. I won't hurt it to miss a day, said Kenny with a shrug. It's too fat anyway. Like him. Not that I said anything. I just glowered then, smiled at Fish, fed him some of the blowflies I'd caught in the homemade trap I made out of a soft drink bottle. I stuck a sunny holiday pic from the weekend magazine on his tank, complete with coconut lined beaches and lots of blue ocean, which had probably been photoshopped, it was so vibrant, but oh, I guessed he'd liked it anyway. Stop molly coddling that bloody fish, said Kenny. I don't want a bloody obese arowana, or it won't be worth anything. Ah, oh, so, so that's what fish was, an arowana. <laughs> Meant a hill of beans to me. At work, I was fired for missing a day. The boss didn't believe my story about the train crash. Bizarre or what? On the homeward train, I sat opposite the fat bald guy again. One of his glass lenses had shattered. Uh, you, you weren't hurt then, I said to him, remembering his flabby body under mine, trying not to shudder with revulsion. What? In the accident? He gave me a funny look and moved his seat. Back home, Kenny was feeding his other fish, the ones in the pond out the back in the sad apology for a garden. Well, that was the main reason we rented this place. The property had a large, dank puddle, choked with weed, illegal water hyacinths and motorbike frogs. Kenny had added koi, goldfish, shabunkins and stuff. He feeds them daily and they pop to the surface at the sound of his voice, just like doughnuts in hot fat. Friendly, fat fish. Shame he isn't so nice to fish indoors, he of the moribund size and sad eyes. Or me. The next day I fed fish with a frog I'd found in the watering can and changed his picture to an underwater shot of the Great Barrier Reef before going into the city and fronting up at the job centre. There were jobs in retail or hospitality. I didn't fancy either and went home to bed. Saturday rolled around and I carried on lounging in bed while Kenny went to the footy. Save for talking to fish and cooking egg and chips, I did nothing else but sulk about my failure to run. Sunday, I vacuumed the shag pile and bleached my hair. Kenny drank beer, belched and scratched his fat belly while watching telly. I filched most of the cash from his wallet while he lay comatose on the couch and stuffed the booty in my knickers drawer. There was no danger of Kenny raiding my lingerie. He'd lost interest a decade or so back when I'd been 30 kilos lighter. Me and Fish, fat and neglected together. Oh, what a sorry pair. I still felt sick to the pit of my stomach that I'd, I'd failed to run. I could have been free of stale beer, soapy hair in the plug hole and shower mould. I decided I needed a plan if I wasn't going to stuff up a second chance of escape. On Monday, I got up, fed fish with an IGA chicken liver, changed his picture to the Nepal feature in the travel mag and then rang my old boss, begging for my job back. He refused. So I ransacked the house looking for more money. I found a, a measly 13 bucks in shrapnel. It wasn't enough to sustain me, but I stashed it away with my other cash under my torturous elastic contour briefs, which are meant to disguise my blubber and save me from dieting. Next, I went to the library and googled arowanas. Goodness! That long slab of marbled scales was actually a dragonfish and worth a mint, boss eyes and all. 
Turns out the gargoyle-eyed look is a common defect and breeders are prepared to have corrective eye surgery on their precious darlings to improve their value. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Well, not me, obviously. I then looked up recipes. Amazing, really, what a girl can do with fish. On the way home, I bought a butterfly net from the toy shop, then spent some time in the garden, messing about in the pond. <laughs> those, those fish were so tame, it was criminal. I just had to tickle my fingers in the water to get them close before scooping them up onto the dead lawn. For tea, I cooked fish mornay. Well, actually, it was mozzarella mirror carp mornay, not that Kenny realised. I jotted down the recipe in my floral Lucky Santa notebook for future reference. A few days later, I visited the city aquarium and spent hours walking through glass tunnels, feeling as though I was one with the sharks. A shame fish couldn't have come with me. He'd have enjoyed it. Well, maybe, maybe not the sharks. I bought a rubber shark with painted blood on its teeth to give him some idea of what he'd missed. That evening I served up fish cakes. They took a heck of a time to prepare because of all those small shabunkin bones. But I reckon the effort was worth it. Even if Kenny lathered them with tomato sauce, the philistine. I carefully wrote down the recipe, making sure to remember the fresh coriander and cracked black pepper. The next day, I returned to the aquarium, plastering my face against the thick glass, as if I could be absorbed through it and into the watery well beyond. Oh, hey, how good would that be? I leaned my whole body against the glass, as best I could. Later, I got arrested and taken to the manager's office. I got off with the warning after I put my clothes back on. The manager gave me his private phone number. <laughs> Cheeky so-and-so. On the way home, the bus collided with the council truck. Again, I was faced with walking away from carnage. Well, even if it was just a dent, but I'd left my escape funds among my not-so-sexy smalls and I balked at disappearing without my minimal wealth and for leaving behind fish. The bus crashed, I told Kenny as he sprawled on the couch glued to the telly. Don't be daft, he said. There was no crash. Are you taking your medication, girlie? Don't you be daft, I said. I'm not the one who needs drugs. You take them like a good girl or you'll get a knuckle sandwich. So I pretended to swallow the pills, then got on with cooking tea. We had battered koi and chips that night with fresh lemon wedges to add a bit of zest. Yum. Oh dear, the fish are getting wise. They don't kiss the pond's surface anymore or surge over the lily pads like sex-mad eels on a mating spree when you toss in breadcrumbs. Kenny reckons a heron's terrorising his watery tarts. If only he knew who was doing the terrorising. Anyway, to make the catching easier, I emptied all my medication into the pond. Could work, you never know. The stuff makes me comatose, why not them? As for fish, who's being treated to the Batavia wreck at the mo? I found some pics on the internet and downloaded them just for him. I've given up vacuuming the shag pile and can almost hear the jubilation of the fleas and dust mites. <laughs> Party time for them. And soon for me. And fish. And maybe the cute aquarium manager. For dinner, Ken and me had creamy seafood pie. Well, more accurately, it should have been called creamy pond food pie. Carp are so versatile, and if you skin them carefully, 
You don't get that muddy, weedy flavour. When are you going to get a job, girlie? Kenny asked one morning after he'd spent ten minutes failing to raise a fish from the murk. We need the money. Oh, I've got me name out there, I said, trying not to sound defensive. Not good enough. Well, maybe I'll, I'll try the fish and chip shop round the corner. Fish, he shuddered. I'm getting sick of eating fish. Well, I'm cooking kedgeree tonight. He looked suspicious. What's that? Rice and stuff. The stuff being the last of the koi I knew who were lurking in the soft black pond mud trying to avoid me. Nice, said Kenny. You have no idea, I said, and gave fish an extra helping of tadpoles I'd bought from the pet shop. I didn't... I didn't want him wasting away. He was valuable, even with his crazy googly eyeballs. Okay, I've had enough. I'm not hanging around for another train or bus accident to make my grand exit from Dead End Ken. I'm going to leave anyway. With Fish, who is my very own get-out-of-jail-free card. Did you get the job at the chippy? Kenny asked me. No, not even an interview. Because I hadn't bothered to follow it up, not that I'm likely to tell him that in case he turns nasty. You're a waste of space, girlie. You're not even keeping up with the housework. I'm cooking your meals. Too much fish. So I cooked beans on toast for tea just to keep the peace. It's time to put my plan into action. I took the train into the city and approached the aquarium manager. He said he'd give my offer careful consideration after doing some homework on the net. He gave me a wink. I gave him a snog. Back home, I said to Kenny, we're having quenelles tonight. And what, what's that when it's at home? Uh, potato balls. I stretched the truth. There wasn't a potato in sight. Quenelles sound posh, but they're dumplings, really, of pure, whizzed-up fish. I didn't think Kenny would spot the difference. His taste buds are shot and he slathers sauce over everything anyway. The quenelles look quite nice. Goldfish dumplings with chervil. I would like to have used fresh chervil, but I had to make do with the dried stuff from the supermarket. Still, they were impressive, even if I do say so myself, because Kenny certainly wouldn't. I caught the last of the fish this morning, an eclectic mixture of goldfish, red, blue, black and silver calico shabunkins, and tiny weeny silvery western pygmy perch. I gutted and marinated them with garlic and almonds. Tonight I'll grill them and serve them with salad and crusty bread. Stuff Kenny if he's fed up with fish. I updated my floral notebook. The next day the aquarium manager rang to say it's a deal. He now knows the value of my seriously exquisite fish. And me. And he also understands the need for secrecy. He's coming over tomorrow with a big plastic tub to transport away fish and give him a a much bigger and better tank. He might even find fish a mate. Sweet. As a farewell meal, I collected some pond snails and winkled them out of their greenish-brown conical shells and popped them in front of fish. He inhaled them like Mr Creosote, his bosky eyes doing a couple of twirls. The rest of the snails I fried in garlic with mushrooms, shallots and a bit of bacon, which Kenny enjoyed with too many belches for it to be pleasant. He totally wrecked the ambience of our last supper. The tank looked forlorn without fish. So I popped in the rubber shark and a bit of weed from the pond. Kenny probably wouldn't notice for a while. 
As an afterthought, I put the recipe book on the table for Kenny to find when he got home. I thought he'd like to know how to cook fish. Or to learn what had really happened to his prized pets. He might even think that fish ended up in one of those dishes, which would be a laugh and a half, or heart attack material. Almost worth hanging around to enjoy, except I'm out of here as soon as. I I did suffer a slight pang, because I knew I'd miss fish, but I wouldn't miss Kenny. So I just walked away. You know, put one foot in front of the other. And I reached the end of the shag pile carpet, the end of the paved path, the end of the railway platform, and I know now there's something to look forward to in life's journey. Especially when you got 20 grand of someone else's money in your new bank account. The end. Thanks so much for listening. We'd love to get your feedback and and we'd love to reach more listeners. Our website is sistersincrime.org.au and our email address is admin at sistersincrime.org.au. Until next Friday then, when we bring you another scintillating story from Australian women crime creators.